Uh, Friends, if you have a Bible with you, please turn to Jeremiah chapter 32. (laughs) Jeremiah 32. And I do want to encourage you, this back section of Jeremiah is fascinating. Um, I do want to encourage you, during the course of the week, as you get time, just please read on. Um, Particularly as you get on to chapter 37 onward, that's where this text gets um, expanded upon as to what is going on with Jeremiah, why he is imprisoned, and the like. So I haven't got the time to go into all of the detail. I'll touch on some things, but if you read chapter 37, 38, and onwards, uh, it's the last days of of Jerusalem before they are eventually, um, uh, the siege ends and Jerusalem falls. So, have any of you ever felt besieged? I'm sure you have. Um, Have any of you had people come to you with bad news? I'm I'm sure you have. Or have you needed to be the bearer of bad news? And perhaps the bad news you brought wasn't well received. Now, this uh, person there is not Gareth when he had a beard. Um, It is Sophocles. This is Sophocles, uh, and this is one of the statements that Sophocles made, and we've added the same statement, I think, occurs in almost every language and every culture under the sun. We, we have it in English often as, um, don't shoot the messenger, or don't kill the messenger, because what would happen is that a messenger would come to a king with bad news, and guess what would happen to the poor messenger? The king would get upset, and the poor messenger would lose his life. And Sophocles, yeah, this is before Christ, had this very obvious statement. No one loves the messenger who brings bad news. And that's often true. And we find in this passage is Jeremiah is very unpopular. Why? Because he brings seemingly bad news. He is seen as a problem But all the way through, he is the one messenger who is bringing the truth of God to a rebellious people. And so Jeremiah, we find, is imprisoned. He has been, and the story, as I say, is fleshed out in chapter 37 and 38. Um, What had happened is the Babylonians came a few years earlier, and... Israel, or rather Judah, called out to the Egyptians for help. And the Egyptians came, and the Babylonians withdrew from Jerusalem to deal with the Egyptians, and they beat the Egyptians. And now the Babylonians have returned, and they have surrounded the city. Everything else has fallen, and this is the last outpost. Jerusalem still stands. And the king, the king is wanting a a positive message, and every time he comes to Jeremiah for a positive message, he doesn't get it. He gets the truth. He gets the fact that the city will fall. That is a given. In fact, he tells the king to surrender to the Babylonians because if he does so, the city will be saved. It will not be burnt and destroyed, but the king in his pride refuses to do this And eventually the city falls and he's burnt to the ground. And in fact, the king has his eyes put out. You know, children are killed as a result of his pride, standing against the word of God. So because Jeremiah brings this negative message, and we'll see some of it now, um, he is in fact in jail at the moment, in, in the courtyard of the king's palace. So let's read the text. So this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the 10th year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, which was the 18th year of King Nebuchadnezzar. The army of the king of Babylon was then besieging Jerusalem, and Jeremiah the prophet was confined in the courtyard of the god 
in the royal palace of Judah. So the city is besieged and they can't get out. They are captive. Jeremiah, who comes with God's word, he himself, in a sense, is besieged. He too is captive. Everything has been turned upside down. Everything is not as it seems. So often, the Jews felt that because God's house, the temple, was in Jerusalem, that, that, that God would somehow save them. All of the other men of God were coming with a positive message that God would intervene and that they would be saved. And of course, remember that when the Egyptians came up, the Babylonians left. Clearly, God's on our side, and they were all hoping for some miracle. But friends, the miracle was not going to come. God's judgment was about to break out finally upon this city. But yes, this takes place somewhere around 600 B.C., 587 to be precise, but 600 years before Christ. So that is 2,600 years removed from where you and I sit today. So what is the relevance? Well, friends, the relevance is that sometimes we as God's people come under attack. The things that once were upheld, the walls that held in, um, that held out rather evil and, 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 and protected the good are falling down. Many of our institutions in our, in, our, in our cities and in our country no longer uphold the truth of God and His Word. Sometimes we ourselves individually might feel besieged. Sometimes we feel that everything seems to be against us. And I know that for some in the church or some watching, times aren't always easy. The question is, God, where are you? Why am I being punished? And sometimes you feel that is happening. Why have I lost my job? Why can't I find a job? Why is my marriage in difficulty? Why are my children not following the ways of the Lord? What about the illness that I'm struggling with or somebody else is? What about deaths even of children where I know that women sometimes miscarry? And it can be incredibly painful where these things happen. Where is God in all of this? There can so often be doubt and despair. And God seems absent. And His presence removed from us. But friends, even in those circumstances, God is not absent. God is still a God who cares, a God of love, a God who is always Emmanuel for those of us who believe, God with us. But friends, reality strikes home. What do we want to listen to, to the lie or to the truth? Verse 3, now Zedekiah, king of Judah, had imprisoned Jeremiah saying, why do you prophesy as you do? Why are you saying all of these negative things? Why should we as the church come with the truth of God's Word when it comes to things like uh, sex outside of marriage or sex between same-sex partners where they might even be married? Many of these things are contrary to God's Word. Why do we as a nation not stand up for life, particularly life in the womb, or life at the end of days. Life is sacred and given by God. So why do you as church prophesy as you do? And friends, we are not popular when we come with God's Word. We simply are not. But do we stand for truth, or do we stand for the lie that the world gives us? Because it's easier. Zedekiah says, to Jeremiah, but you say, Jeremiah, this is what the Lord says. I'm about to hand the city over to the king of Babylon, and he will capture it. Zedekiah, the king of Judah, will not escape out of the hands of the Babylonians, but will certainly be handed over to the king of Babylon, and will speak with him face to face and see him with his own eyes. He will take Zedekiah to Babylon where he will remain until I deal with him, declares the Lord. 
And if you fight against the Babylonians, you will not succeed. In fact, the Jews and the king see, see Jeremiah as something of a traitor. In fact, when the Babylonians removed themselves some years prior, Jeremiah tried to leave the city to go to his own tribal lands to go and deal with issues, and they thought that he was going to go to the Babylonians. And so they actually arrested him, and they kept him incarcerated all the way throughout until Jerusalem eventually falls. And the king is upset about this. Why do you have such a negative outlook? You are, you are taking the courage away from the people. You are acting in a way that is, is traitorous. How can you say these things against your king and against the kingdom? This is not good. And yet, this is the word of God. I wonder if this cartoon by Bennett, you know, it does explain a great truth, doesn't it? The queue at a reassuring lie, and they're all getting their tickets to go in and get their reassuring lie, but an inconvenient truth, there's no one there. So what about you? Do we want the reassuring lie, or do we want the truth of the Lord's Word and His will, even if it is inconvenient and uncomfortable. So why do you prophesy as you do, asks the king. You say that you, we're going to be handed over, that, that Babylonians, Babylonians will capture the city, that we will not escape. In fact, it says we will certainly be handed over. There will be exile. We will be, the king will be dealt with by God. And then these words, you will not succeed. This is so negative. So negative. Jeremiah responds, and there is a change of scene, and it is amazing what happens here, just amazing. Jeremiah said, the word of the Lord came to me. Hanamel, son of Shalom, your uncle, is going to come to you and say, buy my field at Anathoth, because as nearest relative, it is your right and duty to buy it. So just then, as the Lord had said, my cousin Hanamel came to me in the courtyard of the God and said, buy my field at Anathoth in the territory of Benjamin, since it is your right to redeem it and possess it. So buy it for yourself. So what is happening here? So just to put an idea, well, not an idea, just to get context, Anathoth is about a mile or two north of Jerusalem. And guess who is likely encamped at Anathoth, a mile or two north of Jerusalem? The Babylonians. So basically the land is utterly worthless. So if you had a, 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 a superpower army and you were losing the battle, camped upon a field, you are certainly not going to be buying the jolly thing because there's no value. And Jeremiah more than that knows that all of the land is going to fall to the Babylonians. There is no way out. And the word of the Lord comes and the individual comes, Hanamel, to sell him the land. Why? Well, basically, Hanamel is bankrupt. That's what has happened. The Babylonians have taken over the land. He can't work the land. He is now bankrupt, and he is trying everything he can to get some money for his family, perhaps to flee or escape. This is desperate times. Desperate. In Leviticus, it is true when the land belongs to the tribe and cannot be just given away. It needs to stay within the family, and so it's quite right that you go to someone in the family to buy, or as they call it, to redeem the land. And what would happen is after 50 years, on the Jubilee year, the land would revert back to its original owner. 
So land was not lost by people. I think it's a beautiful thing. It really is. And so, yeah, we have Jeremiah in prison, Jeremiah unpopular, Jeremiah knowing that the entire, all of it is going to fall to the Babylonians and the land is actually worthless. He actually buys the land because God tells him to. There is this beautiful step of faith. I knew this was the word of the Lord, so I bought the field at Anathoth from my cousin Hanamel and weighed out for him 17 shekels of silver. We don't know what the land was worth, but, I, but, I, but I'm prepared to, well, I can't say bet, but I, I'm prepared to say that I think he gave him a really good price for the land, fair value for the land, more than fair value. So I signed and sealed the deed, had it witnessed and weighed out the silver on the scales. I took the deed of purchase, the sealed copy containing the ter terms and conditions, as well as the unsealed copy, and I gave this deed to Baruch, son of Neriah, the son of Messiah, in the presence of my cousin Hanamel, and of the witnesses who had signed the deed, and all of the Jews sitting in the courtyard of the God. This is not done in secret, it is done for all to see what is taking place, because there is a lesson here. There is a vital lesson here. And the lesson is this, that in the midst of despair, in the midst of darkness, when you feel besieged, friends, hope is not lost. In their presence I gave Baruch these instructions. And Baruch, we think, was his amanuensis, his secretary. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, take these documents, both the sealed and unsealed copies of the deed of purchase, <coughs> and put them in a clay jar so that they will last a long time. So the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were found in clay jars, weren't they? So just like there, it was put into a clay jar to seal it for another day. A day actually beyond Jeremiah's life. For this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Houses, fields, and vineyards will again be bought in this land. Even though the Babylonians are going to win the day, there will come a time when all will be restored, where God's kingdom will be renewed, where the people will be back in the land. Isn't that an amazing thing? And we know now, but, but that would take place 70 years after this time where the people will start to return, and once again, normality will be brought back to the land. So friends, this, is a, this purchase is a powerful affirmation of faith. The question is, what are you investing in? Are you investing just in this world, the world that will fall, <clears throat> the world that will not last? Is that your hope? Is that your investment? Or are you investing in that which will never fail? Are we investing in that which will last? And friends, so often we spend so much of our time in giving our very souls, our hearts, the best of us to that which will not last. And friends, we need to live balanced lives. Above all, sowing so that we will reap a harvest that will last for all eternity. The Bible has this wonderful story where Jesus in the story calls a rich man a fool. A man has a wonderful harvest, doesn't give thanks to God for the harvest, but he builds these massive barns to contain his harvest so that he can chill out and he can have an easy and a good life. And yet, the Lord calls him a fool because he says, this very night your life will be forfeit, this very night. And then what will happen to all that you have amassed? So friends, we need to be rich towards God. We need to be a people of hope. In Romans chapter 5, and I want to close with this, um, and then I actually tell you a story quickly. No, let me tell you the story, then I'll go to Romans. I found the story uh, in my um, illustrations folder. 
Now, I can honestly say I did check online to see if I could find this individual. I can't honestly say if this is completely and utterly true, but, I th I, but if it is, I think it's an amazing account. This goes back many years. Um, and this was in the Christian Herald, a, a, you know, a certain a Christian publication in the United States. So a family came from Sicily, that's Italy. They came to Sicily, and they came to the United States to try and make a life there. And they both, father and son, worked in a mine, and there was an accident in the mine where dad was killed, and the son lost his one arm, and he's on his, on, on his uh, where is it? Um, yeah, lost his left arm, and he lost his right hand. So I don't know how much you're going to do if this was in the 1920s or the 1930s. Lost an arm, lost a hand, father has died. And it was during his stay in the hospital that his mother was impressed by the Christians that were ministering to her son, so much so that both she and this boy became believers in Jesus. And they joined a church. And in fact, this boy changed his name. And now, I know you've heard in the old days, they would say, well, what is your Christian name? Because there was a time where people would actually take on a Christian name. Um, but they changed their names, and the old name was not mentioned anymore. And this, this, this boy grew up to be a man and, you know, went on to university and apparently got, uh, got a degree and really did quite well for himself. And he changed his name to Giovanni Sperandio. Giovanni Sperandio. Now, the first is Giovanni. It's just the Italian word for John. Giovanni is John. But Sperandio, what a surname. And the reason for the surname is this. The surname means, quite literally, put your hope in God. Is that amazing? Put your hope in God. And is the Lord your hope and your salvation. And so Romans 5, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So friends, even in hard times, God's peace is a miraculous gift to you. So since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And now listen to this. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. I don't know about you. Do you rejoice in your sufferings? Lord, help me. Help us to do this. Because of the glorious hope, we rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And a hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom He has given us. Friends, this is not the hope that the earth has, the world has. This is a hope that is a gift from the Lord, a hope even when times for you might be very hard and you feel that the Babylonians encamp around you. Friends, make the investment in the land. Make the investment in the kingdom of God because your hope is sure and your victory is certain. Let us pray. Jeremiah 32, later on in the chapter, it says this, And these are the words of the Lord over you, over us. I will rejoice in doing them good and will assuredly plant them in this land with all my heart and soul. I will never stop doing good to them. I will inspire them to fear me so that they will never turn away. I will rejoice in doing them good. Lord, how wonderful that 
you gave Jesus your son for us. You have done us so much good. And Lord, how wonderful that you rejoice in the good that you do us. And Lord, for everyone watching online, for everyone in the building here who are struggling, who feel like they are besieged, the armies of evil encamp around them, and there seems no way out. We thank you, Lord, that you are there. We thank you, Lord, that you are victor. We thank you, Lord, that even in suffering, Lord, we can develop perseverance. Even in suffering, we can develop character. And through that, Lord, hope. So, Jesus, pour out your Spirit upon us. May we truly be a people of hope. And so, Jesus, where there needs to be breakthrough, Lord, may it happen in, in your name. Where there needs to be provision, Lord, provide in Jesus' name. You are the God of miracles. And we thank you for the wonderful truth that houses, fields, vineyards will again be bought in the land. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, we're going to close with a... a